All right, folks, so this is Neophyte again, and I wanted to review this amazing case that was documented in the book by Dr. Stephen E. Brody. Here's his website here, jazzphilosopher.com. He is a emeritus philosophy professor. He, I believe he headed the chair at the University of Baltimore, Maryland, and I'm indebted to this information from his book, Immortal Remains, Life After excuse me, Immortal Remains, The Evidence for Life After Death. Really, really cool book here. And he dedicates a chapter to what I think was probably one of the most fascinating cases of this lady by the name of Pearl Curran, or Pearl Curran. She was um, born in the late 19th century. She was a St. Louis housewife. But in 1913... She, um, with her mom and a friend, decided to play with the Ouija board. And eventually, in about a month or so, uh, an alleged entity appeared, calling herself Pat. And the entity, or being, disincarnate soul, whatever you want to call it, then spouted some poetry, saying, quote, Oh, why let sorrow steal thy heart? Thy bosom is but its foster mother, the world its cradle, and the loving home its grave. So Pearl Coran and the others got interested. They began engaging with this being. And it was just fascinating because the, the, the disincarnate or alleged disincarnate soul was spouting poetry, right? Very eloquent language was coming out. And this was considered potentially evidence for survival, that is, a soul being able to survive death, because no one could really explain um, how, no one could account for the level of uh, literary quality that was coming uh, from the Ouija board. And eventually it was found out that pretty much this disincarnate soul was connected only to Miss Pearl Coran. Now the question is, well, how do we explain this? And you can obviously say, well, perhaps, you know, obviously, perhaps Pearl Coran herself was inventing this poetry or this eloquence. However, if you study her background, and Dr. Brody goes in quite depth, um, there's really no explanation. She was born in uh, 1883 an only child. Her father was educated at military school, and uh, she more or less lived across uh, the Midwest. Her father worked for a lead company. Part of her life was spent um, on the prairies in Texas. She went to uh, a Catholic academy, but she was left back. She didn't do too well in school. And uh, for all intents and purposes, and she was heavily investigated and studied by numerous people. Um, she had no interest in literature. She didn't even read more than a chapter of the Bible, according to what she says. Uh, she was not in a negative way, but more or less a simple homemaker in uh, the early 20th century. So how do we explain this? Um, part of the mystery, just to go into this, is that um, Pearl, through this disincarnate being who identified themselves as Patience Worth, alleging that they were born in uh, 17th century England, was able to spout poetic statements, stories, um, conversations at the spur of a moment. So, like, Dr. Brody notes one data point that, for example, um, she was able to dictate a story, 5,000 words in three hours, without pausing, without having to change the story, without any mistakes. Now, anyone who's involved with writing, publishing, um, or if you ever wrote an essay, uh, to be able to spout that much data, that much um, writing or saying in that amount of time without any kind of correction is absolutely remarkable. 
Another part of the mystery was that she was able to do tasks simultaneously. So she was able to write a letter at the same time that under the guidance of Patience Worth, she was able to dictate a poem simultaneously. And Dr. Brody reproduces both of these in the book. So what we're seeing is something certainly fascinating, um, either of great human potential. So there's interests here in terms of consciousness, human ability, or perhaps what many people were interested in was the survivalist hypothesis. Could this be, in fact, proof of life after death? Now, the biggest problem that Dr. Brody goes over is that despite a lot of information being revealed by Patience Worth about what her life was in the 17th century England, um, that she migrated to the Americas, and that she was able to reproduce poetry that was consistent with the time and area where she lived, but also the dialect. So the poetry that was being spouted actually had archaic elements, archaic elements in dialect that was found in that place and time when it was examined by academics. And yet, there is no way to verify that this person ever existed. So they checked. They checked uh, data registries that they have in, uh, in England. Uh, they checked data that's available in the United States. And there is absolutely no evidence that this person ever existed. So what can we say about this? Well, first of all, I just want to take a look at perhaps a couple, couple examples here. Let's see if I can find one. And again, Dr. Brody dedicates an entire chapter to this, which is undoubtedly noteworthy. Okay, let's see. So we've got some stuff here. All right, so check this out. This is one of her early poems uh, attributed to Patience Worth. And again, Miss Coran had no uh, literary um, interests, and she barely finished any level of education. So this was dictated by Patience Worth through Miss Pearl Coran. Quote, I am molten silver running. Let man catch me within his cup. Let him proceed upon his labor, smithing upon me. Let him with cunning smite my substance. Let him at his dream, lending my stuff unto its creation, it shall be no less me. Now, what was interesting was that <clears throat> many of these uh, poems and these works, and she even, like I said, she produced stories, were highly, uh, were received critically very well. But because of the source, because obviously this is under a transmediumship, so to speak, this was pretty much discounted and eventually forgotten. So very few people even know about this remarkable case. But I want to get into a little bit um, about uh, what Dr. Brody speculates. Now, and uh, before I do that, I just want to, again, a caution that anyone who is interested in learning about this, uh, obviously I have a Wikipedia page open here. My experience with Wikipedia is that uh, the, the opinions here are bent on the side of skepticism. Um, I would suggest looking further than what Wikipedia posts. I'd recommend Dr. Brody's book. Again, fascinating chapter. And Dr. Brody is an academic, so he uh, provides a level of rigor and skeptical mythology that I really like. And he also reproduces a lot of the poems themselves, which I would love to read, but I simply can't go into too much here. But um, so again, what, what Dr. Brody suggests is um, if we look at, you know, the survivalist hypothesis, the biggest problem with it is that we cannot verify this person existed. So how can we explain this? Now, one thing he, he goes into is the possibility that perhaps Miss Coran was in fact a savant. Now, typically when we think of savants, we think of people who are gifted in terms of music or perhaps mathematics. We've never really encountered a savant of language or poetry. 
And what if Dr. Brody suggests that we're, we're actually seeing here um, perhaps uh, a first-time case of someone who is a savant of language? Now, one question that might pose is, well, if this is the case, why did it appear so late in Miss Coran's life? Because Miss Coran uh, was in her 30s when this emerged. So that's interesting. Well, Dr. Brody speculates that perhaps this was a latent ability that did not appear until Miss Coran was engaging in the Ouija board um, because some latent abilities can come about in a trance-like state. Or perhaps if people sometimes have multiple personality disorder or some kind of disassociative uh, psychological issue, certain abilities can come up that were otherwise hidden prior to them. And Dr. Brody goes over um, one or two other cases where he supports this thesis with. Um, one medium who was able to reproduce or suddenly produce um, musical abilities late in life. Uh, another medium that was able to produce um, what she alleged was a new language. Um, you know, at the time she was alleging that she was receiving uh, different, you know, mediumship from different uh, areas of the world, uh, even uh, from Mars. You know, obviously that, that's not true. But what we can say is that there is, there does appear to be some precedence of people under altered states demonstrating um, abilities that were otherwise latent. So Dr. Brody's thesis in this is that Pearl Koran is actually uh, a savant, a highly gifted savant that was able to produce um, poetic, stunning poetry, stunning literature at uh, the, the flip of a switch, so to speak. Now, in addition, um, it's hard to explain, though, some of the elements um, such as uh, the reproduction of, of dialects, um, archaic aspects of the poetry that tie into a knowledge of language. One of the things he mentions, for example, uh, in Dr. Brody's book is that some professors looking at the works attributed to Patient's Worth found out that certain words were not even identified as being archaic until after they were pointed out by uh, Miss Pearl Coran, which leads to the, the problem of how can we explain um, this uh, almost clairvoyant knowledge. And so it may be that what we have here is not simply a savant, but someone who is also gifted with ESP, um, clairvoyance and perhaps telepathy who in their subconscious was able to gather this information and then through their gifted ability to then produce stunning poetry. It's a very interesting thesis that Dr. Brody posits here. Um, my biggest problem personally is, is just, again, uh, the elements that we see here that point to this ESP ability. And the one hypothesis that doesn't seem to be suggested is, well, if we're not dealing with a disincarnate soul of somebody, what if we're dealing with some sort of entity, perhaps a non-human entity? That, this is, itself is very speculative and controversial. But what I find fascinating about these mediumship cases is that the mediums often have what's called a control. The control is like an intermediary between the medium and uh, the alleged disincarnate person that they're contacting. Um, virtually all the mediums of um, the late 19th and early 20th century had some sort of control that acted as that that acted in, as the function of an intermediary. And what's interesting is that these intermediaries, although they allege to be people, that themselves are disincarnate, in other words, people that have survived death, when you investigate the data about them, it appears that it's not true. 
So in other words, they're not the, the information about the historical person that they claim to be is not verifiable and in fact contradicts. So one theory, and Dr. Brody posits this, is that perhaps these controls are in fact constructs of the consciousness of the medium. Okay, that's that's definitely possible. But again, what if in fact these controls are not constructs, nor are they disincarnate souls, but are rather some sort of non-human entity that is in fact posing as some kind of uh, you know human being that once existed? And that's a really really uh, interesting speculation. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily saying they're demons. I mean, they could simply be some kind of neutral entity that is uh, acting as an intermediary between uh, alleged souls, post-mortem, and mediums. But it's a hypothesis that um, I don't really see entertained there. But anyway, that was uh, Dr. Brody's uh, thesis. And again, he dedicates an entire chapter to this case. I highly recommend learning... Uh, learning about this again the elements that fascinate me is that this this uh, th this material sprouted when this person miss Coran was in her 30s the material is of exquisite value that cannot be attributed to miss Coran uh, at least not from what we know about her life and her life was thoroughly researched by academics and people who were studying her at the time um, multiple interviews of her family, her friends, everything that we know about her is that she was just a very simple homemaker living in uh, uh, the early 19th century, um, a married woman. And so we find uh, an effect that we cannot attribute to the cause, at least by conventional matters. So Dr. Brody's thesis that perhaps this is a latent savant ability combined with ESP, you know, is an interesting one, but I suggest you try to find material on uh, what she actually wrote. Um, again, uh, the fact that she was able to produce material spot on. Uh, these aren't just poems, these are books. She literally, uh, under mediumship, produced books. One of the other fascinating things was that she was able to return to a book that she was working on after some time. So she may have written, let's say, or composed 30% of the book. Time passes. She's doing other mediumship activity. And then she returns to the point she left off without any kind of hesitation or problems. And she just resumes um, composing the book. So absolutely fascinating case. And again, no mistakes, no problems, no errors in what she did. Highly recommend getting Dr. Brody's book, Immortal Remains. The Evidence for Life After Death, and uh, The Patient's Worth Case is Chapter 5. Anyway, my friends, take care of yourselves and be safe out there.